The right to privacy is very important to me. My family has had a single P.O. box for several generations. We only ever subscribe to two magazines, Reader's Digest and Ebony. When it comes to science, just how much information about those who participate in research and conduct that research should be public and how much should be private. The purpose of academic research is to contribute positively to the wealth of human knowledge, to add to the totality of everything that we know about the world, from the microscopic to the astronomical, and that includes the social sciences. It is extremely important to ensure the anonymity of participants in academic surveying and experimentation, not only because it protects them from any possible negative repercussions that their responses may elicit, but because it helps reduce biases on the part of the researchers, and is the purpose of blind peer review. Just as justice is blind, science must also treat all subjects equally. But to what degree does that umbrella of privacy extend beyond participants in research? Should it include the researchers? What about those who assist in that research? And is it ethical to have your image used in research against your own knowledge, if the goal of that research is only the pure pursuit of knowledge? In October of 2023, a truck depicting the names and photos of students who had allegedly signed a letter blaming Israel for the same month's attacks on the nation from Hamas terrorists drove around the campus, with the truck labeling these students as, quote, Harvard's leading anti-Semites, as well as a link to a website titled harvardhatesjews.com. Whatever you may think about the opinions of those students, did they deserve to have their names and faces plastered on a truck being driven around their own university's campus? Today, let's examine academic ethics as it concerns personal privacy by looking at a case where a scholar arguably could have crossed a line by using private photos of students, collected without their knowledge, and asked his assistants to rate the physical attractiveness of their fellow students to study the effects of appearance on grades. Additionally, let's examine those effects. That beautiful people tend to be more successful, what's known as the beauty premium, while less beautiful people tend to be less successful, the ugly tax. Rating the attractiveness of other people is common and typically done without the other person's knowledge, but is it ethical to rate others as hot or not for the purpose of academic and scholarly research? But before we begin, I want to talk a little bit about why this topic was of particular interest to me. Recently, I made a video where I made fun of a particularly bad piece of academic research, which was struck with a privacy complaint from one of the authors and has been removed from YouTube. There is nothing more I can do at this point to have the video restored, despite the fact that it contained absolutely no private information beyond what was available on the scholars' public university profiles and curricula vitae. If you would like to see that video, it is available on Odyssey and will be linked down below in the description. However, it's because of things like this that I'm so incredibly thankful to all of you and your support of my work. And if you would like to support both me and protect your own privacy, you can do so by checking out this video's sponsor, Private Internet Access. Private Internet Access allows you to browse the web away from the prying eyes of companies and entities that may be interested in collecting your data. You can quickly and easily hide and change your IP address location, not only to protect your anonymity, but also to gain access to TV shows and movies that aren't available where you live. Private Internet Access is so devoted to being exactly what it says on the tin that not only do they have a strict no-logs policy, but you can even pay for the service using cryptocurrency. Just one account protects unlimited devices, contains a built-in ad blocker, and comes with 24-7 customer support. There's a reason they have more than 15 million satisfied customers. And you can join us by using a special deal that Private Internet Access is offering to my viewers. By clicking the link in the description or using the QR code on the screen, you'll get 83% off a two-year plan plus four months of service absolutely free. That's just over $2 a month. If you don't like the service, and I think you will, worry not because it all comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Thank you so much to Private Internet Access for sponsoring this video, and to all of you, you beautiful people, for supporting my work and by checking out my sponsor. And speaking of beautiful people, let's examine the beauty premium, the ugly tax, the case of Adrian Mehek, and the ethics of rating others on their physical attractiveness. In 
2022, a study from a Swedish doctoral student at the University of Lund made headlines across the globe, with a finding that was of particular interest in the post-pandemic world. The finding? <laughs> well, I'm in Norway right now. But at least I'm not in Sweden! Well, that attractive female university students' grades had plummeted after the switch to online distance learning. Why? Well, simply put, because professors are as biased as anyone else and grade, likely subconsciously, based on their students' looks. Also, some of them sleep with their students, but that's an issue for another time. Before the pandemic, the students rated as most attractive received on average a 7-10% to advantage in grades compared to students rated as unattractive, but during COVID, with classes largely being held online, this advantage fell to 3-4%. to The whole world locks down, hot, young, attractive women, and to a lesser degree, young men most affected. But while the study made headlines for its findings, that was only the beginning of the paper's notoriety, as within days of it drawing public attention outside of academia, several students whose photos had been rated for attractiveness began to speak out about it. And what were they speaking out about? The fact that none of them had consented to be a part of this study. The researcher behind it, Adrian Mehek, a doctoral student at the University of Lund School of Economics in Sweden, gathered photos of students from their public social media profiles and provided them to a panel of 74 other students who rated their classmates' physical appearance on a scale from 1 to 10. But Mehik did not contact any of those being rated to request permission to use their photos. Philippa Ramberg and Siri Fedberg, wait, no, Svedberg, two girls whose likenesses had been used in the research spoke to Swedish news outlet Expressen to give their opinions on the subject matter, with Philippa saying that she was shocked to learn that she had been rated by strangers without her knowledge. They found out about it at the same time the rest of the world did. With students now expressing concerns regarding the ethics of the paper, the university opened an investigation into Mehek's conduct. Well, who amongst us hasn't stolen photos from students' Facebook pages to use them in academic research? Let he who is without sin throweth the first rock, and I shalt smoke of it. Fanny Holmquist and Rasmus Backlund, two scholars who study industrial economics, publicly criticized elements of the study's methodology and told the news outlet Lundegaard that they were able to easily identify individual students within three minutes, presumably using the raw data set and cross-referencing student grades and courses taken. But I don't think I would describe that as being easily identifiable, considering that the only people who would have access, or at least easy access, to that information within three minutes would presumably be faculty at the University of Lund. They told Lundegaard, that anyone could access the class grade list from the university. But again, I wouldn't exactly describe that as an easy process, and even if one was motivated to do so, they would also need the full data set from the economics letter journal in which the paper was published. At some point, I believe this may have been available online in Appendix B, but currently it is not included in the publication PDF, nor on the webpage, nor was it available in the earliest cached version of the website although it is still potentially available upon request. While possible, that's a hell of a lot of work to put into trying to figure out the identity of a college student whose attractiveness was rated in an online social science study that garnered some minor media attention. The methodological issue that concerned Holmquist and Backlund was that Mehik categorized some courses within the engineering department as qualitative and others as quantitative, and they believed his categorization to be faulty. Mehek only defined mathematics and physics courses to be quantitative, placing all other courses in the qualitative category. He separated these two types of courses because quantitative classes tend to rely mostly, if not exclusively, on graded coursework and examinations, while qualitative courses are more likely to involve group projects, seminars, and presentations. For Mehek, this was potentially of import because, presumably, teachers will have less interpersonal interaction with their students in quantitative courses that rely on tests than they would in courses that are more qualitative and rely on group work or public speaking. While a debate could be had regarding the accuracy of this division, as it applies to all classes, I personally do not believe it to represent a serious methodological issue, as the categorization ultimately in no way changed the data nor the way in which they were assessed, 
and was only done to examine a possible difference in the way that distance learning influenced the power of attractiveness on grade differentials between students. Despite the fact that Holmquist and Backlund claimed that they were able to identify individual students within three minutes, they strangely seemingly were unable to take those same three minutes and put them to use by, I don't know, actually reading Mehek's paper, in which he clearly lays out that he was not saying that first-year courses on industrial engineering are qualitative because industrial engineering is a qualitative field, but instead because the first-year course on industrial engineering involved group projects, oral presentations, and seminars. While the main focus of this video is going to be on the ethics of Mehek's paper, I did also think it necessary to clarify what the supposed methodological errors were, because, and this is just my opinion, people were so incensed by how Mehek had conducted the study that they began making other claims about it that weren't really accurate. In social science research, as we will soon see, there are two competing phenomena, the halo effect and the horn effect. The former refers to the tendency to view beautiful people as also more intelligent and capable, while the horn effect describes the opposite, the tendency to view unattractive people as stupid and incompetent. And I believe that the broader criticisms of Mehek's research are kind of manifestation of the horn effect. Just because he potentially did something unethical in one aspect must mean the paper is methodologically flawed, and therefore even the findings are bunk. But is that really true? Let's begin by looking at some of the research on the halo effect and the power that appearance has on nearly every aspect of social success. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder, as the saying goes, but just how subjective really is physical appearance? Insert Dungeons & Dragons cartoon show joke here. A series of 11 meta-analyses drawn from 1,800 articles and 919 samples from Langois et al. 2000 found that there was a large amount of agreement both within and across people of different cultures and amongst both adults and children on who was and was not good-looking indicating that despite disparities between different cultural norms, everyone, even kids, know when a person is beautiful and when they're not. Children are actually rather notoriously savage when it comes to judging appearances. But now that's the thing I'm sensitive about! While trends do change, and some research, such as that of, and I'm going to butcher these names, Burusapat and Lekdang, 2019, who examined the facial proportions of Miss Universe winners, has found that the exact preferred facial features can change somewhat over time, we all more or less agree on who is hot and who's not. And speaking of, a lot of people are seemingly invested in finding out where they fall on the hot or not scale. Hence the once popular but absolutely still around website, hotornot.com, since rebranded as Chat and Date, which doesn't at all sound nefarious, but soared in usage in the 2000s before the era of modern social media. The premise of the site was simple. Upload a photo of yourself and other people will rate your attractiveness on a scale from 1 to 10. Like Berry Boys, but for people. Hey Mark, look at this card just got for 20 quid. How about we rev one for the lads watching? The site, while now largely forgotten to time, was massively influential, inspiring Mark Zuckerberg to create Face Smash, the predecessor to Facebook and actually served as a host for Twitter in its earliest forms. Twitter being parasitic as always. It's almost unbelievable how one website spawned so much evil. While Hot or Not has mostly faded into memory, its premise has remained perennial. Reddit alone has multiple boards dedicated solely to uploading photos of yourself to be judged and to judge others, including r slash rate me, true rate me, face ratings, am I ugly, and accurately rate me, just to describe a few, and the latter of which describes itself as, quote, an accurate and objective facial aesthetics ratings and advice board. And again, that's just a few of them, and only on Reddit, which combined have hundreds of thousands of members. While some of these are very generous in their scores and full of thirst posting, others, such as Accurately Rate Me, take this task extremely seriously, featuring entire guides for both posters and raters to follow and definitely isn't a training ground for facial recognition AI. Either way, Clearly, a lot of people want to judge others and be judged themselves. But the perpetual question of all social science remains. Why? Why would you do that? Why would you do any of that? 
why would anyone intentionally set themselves up to be judged by anonymous strangers? Well, anonymity itself luckily does play a role because of the nature of de-individuation effects. When people are anonymous, they're not bound by the rules of polite society and face no repercussions for speaking their mind or, well, just being a jerk. The latter is, of course, a given on Reddit. Online de-individuation is the phenomena behind toxic disinhibition, which we all know more colloquially as trolling. We do a little trolling. It's called we do a little trolling. But de-individuation can also manifest positively in, for example, the strangers on a train effect, which is not when you get stabbed in England, but rather describes a scenario in which, due to their anonymity, people feel free to disclose deeply personal information about themselves and may find solace in sharing their stories in a shroud of privacy that anonymity provides. Inherently, when you're sharing a photo, though, only one side is fully anonymized, the writers. And they have absolutely nothing to lose by being honest or by being cruel. So why do people post selfies online in the first place? Sung et al. 2016 surveyed South Korean subjects regarding motivations for posting selfies on social networking sites. After conducting a pilot survey in which participants provided the researchers with a list of motivations, and another set of evaluators rated the face validity of those motivations, not on their faces, the scholars were left with 38 unique motivations that broadly fell into four categories. Attention-seeking, which concerned self-esteem, showing off, desires to be seen by members of the opposite sex, or same sex, I suppose, as well as just wanting one's existence to be affirmed by others. Communication, which concerned staying in contact and interacting with friends, family, and acquaintances. Archiving, which concerned recording special events, everyday life, and hobbies. And entertainment, which concerned alleviating boredom, passing the time, and refreshing oneself. A third group of participants were asked about their motivations for posting selfies, the frequency at which they posted them, their intentions to post them regularly in the future, and completed a narcissistic personality inventory test. They found that attention-seeking accounted for the most variance of the four motivation categories, 21.84%, followed by communication, 19.66%, then archiving, 18.54%, and finally, entertainment, which accounted for 11.38% of the variance. Narcissism was positively correlated with three of the four motivations, attention-seeking, communication, and entertainment. Only archiving was not related to narcissistic tendencies. Similarly, the frequency of posting selfies was related to attention-seeking, communication, and entertainment motives, but not to the archiving motive, and was positively correlated with narcissism. All four motives and narcissism were related to intentions to post selfies in the future. When it comes to posting a selfie on a website like Hot or Not or a subreddit for the purpose of having others rate your physical attractiveness, however, it's very unlikely that anyone is posting there for archival purposes, and probably primarily as a form of attention-seeking. Recall that attention-seeking wasn't limited to just wanting, well, attention generally, but also to a desire to be noticed or to have one's existence reaffirmed by others, as well as seeking attention specifically from the opposite sex and showing off. So why do people ask to be rated by strangers online? I would wager it largely falls into that attention-seeking motive which is itself related to narcissistic tendencies. A similar study from Bill Cotti and Passini 2018 queried 237 Italian citizens regarding their selfie posting behavior on Facebook. Specifically, the frequency at which they posted pictures of themselves, the importance they placed on the number of likes a selfie received, and their motivations for doing so, as well as their narcissistic traits and their level of self-esteem. The motives were the same as those in Sung et al. Attention-seeking, communication, archiving, and entertainment. The number of likes were positively associated with the number of selfies posted that included only the poster or the poster and a group of friends, meaning more validation encourages more output of similar content. Likes were not related to the frequency of posting selfies with a romantic partner. All of the assessed motivations for posting were also positively related to the number of selfies posted, but archiving, entertainment, and communication were those most strongly correlated with selfie frequency. Again, for group and solo selfies, while none of the four motivations given were related to posting a selfie with a significant other. Higher scores on the Narcissistic Personality Inventory, or NPI, were related directly to posting for attention and entertainment, as well as to posting solo selfies, and just the NPI itself was mildly correlated with self-esteem, unsurprisingly. 
self-esteem was negatively related to posting for attention or entertainment, and to the number of likes that the selfie received. That is, people with low self-esteem are probably not posting selfies for the purpose of gaining attention nor for fun, and reported fewer likes on their posts. While narcissism was related positively to posting a solo selfie, self-esteem was related positively to posting a selfie with a romantic partner. Although these data concerned Facebook, from them we could extrapolate that people who struggle with self-esteem issues are probably not going to post images of themselves to places like r slash rate me because they want attention or to entertain themselves at least. Instead, more narcissistic people seeking attention or to entertain themselves are probably going to be the people who want to show their faces off online, at least anonymously. Strangely, I was not able to locate any research specifically concerning the motivations behind posting to sites or forums with the specific purpose of eliciting ratings of attractiveness, which is why I conducted a study on it myself. After running a frankly crappy pilot study with my followers on X and members of my Discord, which was crappy in part because I was trying to just get a better idea of what I was even doing, like I said, no one studied this before for some reason, but also because I didn't really want to pay SurveyMonkey £100 just to use the logic function. I still did manage to get some interesting feedback. I queried participants who had previously posted a photo of themselves online for the explicit purpose of being rated on their physical appearance on their motivations for doing so. Using the attention-seeking motivation scale adapted from Sung et al. 2016, the Narcissistic Personality Inventory, the Rosenberg Self-Esteem Scale, and on the ethics of rating people's attractiveness without their knowledge nor consent. Well, I was a bit taken aback by just how expensive it is to fund survey research, as the last time I did it, I used Reddit, <laughs> but the many subreddits about rating people's appearance didn't like me posting the link there, curiously. But thanks to you all, I was able to gather some data, and the data that I did gather, while well, minor, still provide a lot of insight into this phenomenon. And again, I want to give a huge shout out and a thank you to everyone who participated in the survey. The vast majority of people had not posted a photo online for the purpose of being rated on their appearance, 86% of those who had done so. The largest portion asked for ratings on some form of dating site or app, 46%, followed by other platforms, 31%, which included 4chan and Discord. 15.4% posted to Reddit, and 7.69% nice, posted to Facebook to ask for ratings on their looks. The most common reason that participants gave for asking others to rate their appearance was for attention from the opposite or same sex, 38.5%, followed by a desire to gain self-confidence, to be acknowledged by others, or for a non-specified reason, all at 15.4%. Reasons given that were not specified were curiosity and being, quote, bored and horny. 7.7% of participants stated that their reason was to attract attention or to show off, respectively. No participants indicated that their intention was to have their existence reaffirmed by others. As to why they chose to post these photos, and what kind of responses they anticipated, the most common answer was for honesty, 77%, followed by seeking advice and sexual interest, both at 61.5%, praise and criticism, also matched at 46%, kindness at 38.5%, and finally, actively seeking hate, 7.7%. In terms of the responses they actually received, advice was the most frequent, 54%, followed by criticism, jealousy, honesty, sexual interest, and non-specified answers, all at 31%. The non-specified answers all stated that they received no responses at all. Finally, 23% of participants reported that they received either kindness or praise. If you're wondering why these numbers add up to over 100%, it's because I allowed subjects to select multiple answers, as people often have multiple reasons for doing, well, pretty much anything. The plurality of respondents stated that their experience posting their photo or video online to be rated was a neutral experience, 38.5%, while 31% described the experience as positive, 15.4% as negative, and 7.7% described the experience as either very negative or very positive. The relationship between having posted online for the purpose of garnering attention and narcissism was significant and negative, indicating that people do not post photos of themselves because of purely narcissistic tendencies, but rather much the opposite. There was no significant relationship between posting for attention-seeking reasons and self-esteem. However, there were some unique interactions. People who posted specifically for the purpose of garnering attention tended to have statistically higher ratings of self-esteem than those who posted to gain confidence, for example. While posting specifically for the purpose of seeking attention from the opposite or same sex 
was largely unrelated to self-esteem consistently. The majority of respondents, 75%, reported that it was not unethical to rate the appearance of others without their consent. However, 50% also reported that it was unethical for researchers to use photos of people without their consent for the purpose of being rated on their physical appearance compared to 25% who said it was not and another 25% who said that they were unsure. When asked to describe how they would feel if someone rated their physical appearance without their knowledge, one participant said it would make them feel, quote, used like a piece of meat. Several said they wouldn't care, others that they would be surprised, and one specifically that they would only care in the context of a published piece of research, but not by random strangers. The majority sentiment was that they just didn't really care. However, I should clarify that my sample was entirely male, with an average age of 25 to 35, and were heavy internet users who reported largely using the net for over 36 hours a week. So this survey is in no way representative of the broader population. However, I still think it's pretty interesting. We can see though from that small sample that even amongst people who do post their photos online for the purpose of garnering attention, they're not posting for the same reason, nor do they share the same psychological profiles. There was a negative relationship between posting photos to be rated and narcissism, but not a relationship with self-esteem, which indicates perhaps a tendency towards what's known as vulnerable narcissism. Symptoms of vulnerable narcissism include withdrawal, low self-worth, and blaming others. And the lack of a relationship to self-esteem solidifies that point. People who post selfies online for others to rate them for the purpose of attention seeking have vastly different motivations based on their personal levels of narcissism and self-esteem, with individuals higher in self-esteem doing so for attention from others, while those lower in self-esteem are likely seeking validation through a boost in self-confidence that they may otherwise lack. So now that we have some novel data to better understand why people post selfies online to be rated specifically by others, let's look further into that study that garnered international notoriety and attention because it did so without consent. And as the majority of my participants agreed, that does present an ethical issue. But first, we need to look a little bit more into research to better understand the context of education during COVID in which this potentially unethical study was conducted. In 2019, the entire world, from social norms to medicine, to finance, to education, was turned upside down as COVID ravaged the globe and altered the way people did pretty much anything, to some extent or another. One field that was particularly influenced by the COVID lockdowns was that of academia as classes moved away from face-to-face -face and onto the internet. And with that came a plethora of issues that social scientists were only just beginning to understand before countless schools moved into a distance learning model. While some research has found that the switch to online learning had little effect on student outcomes, including a systematic analysis from Kusamariono, Drupianto, and I'm not even going to try to pronounce that last one, in 2021. Other studies, such as one from a sample of over 400 Hong Konger medical students from Fu Chuang and Chu 2021, found significant decreases in all five levels of proficiency that they examined, participation, communication, preparation, critical thinking, and group skills. From Kusamariono et al.'s analysis, it seems that some students in some programs, with some teachers, excelled during distance learning, while others performed better in face-to-face -face classrooms, seemingly evening out the positives and negatives. But regardless of the efficacy, a ton of students spent a couple of years learning almost entirely from their laptop or computer screens, rather than from a lecture hall. Obviously, researchers were champion at the bit to better understand not just the learning outcomes, but absolutely everything about what this move towards distance learning meant for education. And so inevitably, somebody had to ask the question, how does physical appearance of students play a role in their grades when you take the classroom online? Students being hot for teacher or teacher being hot for student is beyond a trope. It's also somewhat of a truism, as unethical as it may be. Although the criminal justice system usually tends to turn a blind eye to women teachers abusing their positions of power over young men, but I digress. The question remains, does student hotness actually have any effect on grades? And if it's true that professors grade students differently based on their physical attractiveness, then did any of that change when teaching went almost entirely digital? That was the question asked by Adrian Mehek, 
If removal from the physical classroom could equalize grading by helping to remove physical attractiveness, producing a bias, well then surely that would be a boon in favor of arguments for distance learning, right? If true, online courses could help level the playing field made unequal by differences in physical attractiveness. A plethora of research has indicated over a long period of time that appearance plays a role in certain forms of success in life, and that includes in the classroom. Pretty people are simply treated differently based on their looks than are not-so-pretty people. The halo effect describes a tendency for more attractive people to be perceived more positively in areas outside of their physical appearance. We tend to like pretty people. And while the effect has been studied since the 1970s, it appears to be perennial and universal. As a study from Batres and Shiramizu, 2022, found that people who were rated as more attractive were also seen as more confident, emotionally stable, intelligent, responsible, sociable, and trustworthy in samples from 45 countries, representing every populated region of the world. It doesn't just end there, though, as the halo effect of beauty also extends to success. In his book, Beauty Pays, Why Attractive People Are More Successful, Dr. Daniel Hammermesh reported that in the 1970s, the looks of women had a more positive impact on their earnings than did men's looks, which were largely only deleteriously impacted by their appearance. Specifically, the most attractive women received 8% higher pay than did average-looking women, while the least attractive earned 4% less than an average-looking woman, as rated by participants. Comparatively, while the most attractive men earned 4% more than average-looking men, the least attractive men earned 13% less than the average. Complain to me again about that gender pay gap, ladies. He also found that lifetime earnings reflected this trend, with the most attractive making about $1.69 million, while the least attractive earned about $1.46 million. Which may sound insignificant when put into such terms, but that means that being particularly attractive nets you around $230,000 more over the course of your life than someone born without such a blessing, and $140,000 less than an average-looking person. And again, that's in the 1970s. Hammermesh noted that he had witnessed similar results in Australia, Canada, Shanghai, China, Korea, and the United Kingdom. Less attractive people, on average, earn less money. But Hammermesh's data and his book are dated. So let's look at some slightly more recent research, and more importantly, some experimental data from Mobius and Rosenblatt 2005, who assigned students to a role of either employee or employer. First, potential employees completed a short maze-solving problem, and then estimated how many mazes that they believed they could solve over a 15-minute period if he or she were to perform the task as a paid job. The amount of time it took these potential employees to finish the practice maze was included on a resume alongside with his or her age, university, matriculation year, previous job experience, extracurricular activities, and hobbies on a resume to be submitted to potential employers hiring for just such a hypothetical maze-solving position. Although these potential employees were asked to estimate how many mazes that they thought they could correctly complete within a 15-minute period, that guess was withheld from the employer and instead served only as a measure of self-confidence and general rat-like behavior. The employers were exposed to employees in a variety of ways. Hey, phrase it! In the first condition, employers only saw the employee's resumes. In the second, they saw the resumes accompanied by a photo of the employee. In the third, the employers saw the resume sans photo, but conducted a five-minute telephone interview with the employee. In the fourth, the employer saw the resume with the photo and talked via the phone for five minutes, as in the third condition. And in the fifth and final condition, the employers saw the resume with the photo and then conducted a five-minute face-to-face interview with the potential employees. Employers were asked to predict how many mazes an employee could solve over a 15-minute period, and were informed that their estimates would influence the wages earned by that employee for completing their tasks. These wages would be drawn from their own pool of resources containing 4,000 points, and each completed maze was rewarded with 100 points, thus incentivizing the employers to pick the best employees, such as to not cost them their own earnings. And these were real earnings. These experiments were conducted at three different universities in Tucumán, Argentina, where the typical hourly wage at the time was about 6 pesos, and while all participants were paid 12 pesos for participation, each completed maze paid a quarter of a peso. On average, respondents to the study earned 14.34 pesos on top of their guaranteed 12 for their participation. In other words, if you picked the best employee for the job of solving mazes, 
you could have earned four to five times the hourly wage in the region. So did employers pick the best workers for the job or did they pick the most attractive ones? Before the experiments began, photos of the employees were rated by 50 local high school students, famously known for not being catty and judgmental on their attractiveness. Like I said, kids are cruel, cool, Jack, and I love monitors. <laughs> Allowing the scholars to get an idea of which photos were seen as more attractive and which were seen as less, on average. Physically attractive workers were significantly more confident in their performance, and there was a small but significant positive relationship between predicted completion of mazes and actual completion, such that an increase of one standard deviation in beauty produced an increase of between 13 and 16% in confidence. Although men completed more puzzles than did women, duh, the effect of beauty on confidence and thereby on actual completion was unaffected by sex. In total, though beauty had an effect on confidence, which in turn had a small effect on productivity, prettier people were not inherently more productive. While obviously beauty had no effect on employers' wages for a given worker when no photo was attached to the resume, in all other conditions, the beauty premium was present. Specifically, there was a 12 to 13% increase in wages for each standard deviation increase in beauty when the resume included a photo and in both forms of the phone interview, and a 17% increase in wages when the two spoke face to face. It is particularly interesting that the beauty premium seemed to extend even to just a phone call when no photo was present, but it's likely that finding has something to do with the increased confidence possessed by more attractive people, as additional analyses found that 15 to 20 percent of the beauty premium was transmitted through confidence and about 40 percent each through visual and audio stimuli. Thus, yes, it seems that people will trust more attractive people to also be better at their job and thus will be more willing to pay them a premium even at the potential cost of their own earnings. And yes, the entire field of social science is largely just providing evidence for things that everybody already knows. And thus, going out of the lab and into real life, a study from Pfeiffer 2012 utilized data from the 2008 German Social Survey, which interviewed more than 3,000 participants, querying them on a variety of topics, including employment, income, education, social and political behavior, and of course, the perpetual German desire they need to destroy Europe. The interviewer rated the physical attractiveness of each interviewee both at the start of their interaction and after its conclusion, while the interviewee provided their own ratings of their own perceived attractiveness, both on an 11-point scale. A single one-point increase in ratings of attractiveness were related to a 3% greater probability of being employed. To put that into perspective then, a 5-point increase in attractiveness would predict employment status to the same degree that being female or having a college degree would similarly predict employment. Relatedly, a 1-point increase in attractiveness, as rated by the interviewer, was related to a 3% increase in monthly income, although these effects were larger for men than for women, and were stronger at the beginning of the interview than they were at the end, indicating that first impressions of attractiveness are more strongly related to predicting the connection between that attractiveness and earnings. In contrast, self-reported attractiveness was more strongly related to wages in women than it was in men, but ratings of the interviewer were more predictive of earnings compared to self-report in either sex. That is, people probably aren't very good at rating their own levels of attractiveness. These results were persistent across all wage distributions. Of perhaps unique interest to us today, though, is that in addition to wages, more attractive men and women were both more likely to have a college degree. Because of the implication. Oh, uh, okay. You had me go on there for the first part. The second half kind of threw me. A plethora of research over the years has identified and tracked this effect with the benefits in the workplace accrued by the beautiful being known as the beauty premium, while the detriments faced by the unattractive being known as the ugly tax. There is probably no better example of the beauty premium than the popularity and protection from YouTube given to SS Sniper Wolf. In October of 2023, Sniper Wolf, a YouTuber actively celebrated and pushed by the platform, constantly appearing on its front page, whose content consists entirely of her lazily reacting to TikToks, and I use the word react extremely liberally, for an audience of millions of children and simps because absolutely no one else, no adult with a brain and lacking a boner, could suffer this garbage. Wow. Metal do be magnetic though. On oh, God, no cap. Just rolled up to fellow creator Jack's Film's house posting a video of his home address to her Instagram that has 5.6 million followers. 
Why? Because Jack, a YouTube veteran if there ever was one, had been mocking her horrible yet YouTube-approved non-tent by turning her lack of reactions into a bingo game. While Jack had been critical of Sniper Wolf in the past, it was only after she called him a sexist on Twitter that he began hosting his b -b -b bingo nights on Twitch. Despite California Penal Code Section 653.2 defining what she did as illegal in the state, YouTube simply temporarily demonetized a single video, her most recent, as punishment for committing a crime and putting a man and his wife and their dog's lives at risk. Why? Because Sniper Wolf is an attractive woman. That's all it comes down to. If any male YouTuber showed up to a female YouTuber's house in the middle of the night and posted her address online to 5.6 million people, he would be gone in seconds. But because Sniper Wolf is attractive, she faces almost no repercussions. But if these effects, the beauty premium and the ugly tax, are present in the workplace and on YouTube, are they also present in higher education? Do more attractive people get higher grades? Do they get into better colleges? If so, then it would seem that the beauty premium would not only influence interviews and resumes, but what goes on those resumes in the first place. Is being beautiful really life on easy mode? The role of beauty in college admissions was assessed by Ong Shi and Shang, 2022, comparing 30 universities in the US and China and their respective national rankings. The scholars randomly sampled 30 student profiles of 2012 graduates from Facebook for US universities and from a similar Chinese social media service, Renren, for Chinese universities. US and Chinese participants were asked to rate the attractiveness of these students, included in a series of 900 images of different people on a 1 to 7 scale. In the American samples, more attractive men were more likely to have graduated from a higher-ranked college than were less attractive men, while women's attractiveness was not statistically significant. There was no effect of attractiveness of college rank in China for either sex. Specifically, for American men, a one-rank increase in reported beauty was related to a 0.5 increase in the rank of the college that he had attended. To put that into perspective, being rated as two points higher in attractiveness could be the difference between being admitted to a state university versus an Ivy League college. This effect was particularly pronounced in white men who attended private colleges as while the effect of a single rank increase in beauty was 0.32 for public colleges, it was 1.74 for private colleges. However, when only technology-focused colleges were included, such as the Illinois Institute of Technology, the New Jersey Institute of Technology, and the Stevens Institute of Technology, white male graduates were not as much more attractive than those who attended lower-ranked universities, compared to white males who attended non-private, non-technology-focused institutions who were much more attractive than men at lower-ranked universities. In other words, they don't really care what you look like so much at MIT as they do at Princeton. As such, while it does seem that more attractive white men may be more likely to be admitted into more prestigious institutions, it doesn't appear that physical appearance has any relationship to admissions for non-white men or for women of any race in the United States. If we look at the top private institutions, where white males are rated as significantly more attractive than were white males at less elite institutions, Harvard, Columbia, Penn, and MIT, we find that Harvard is 18.9% white males, Columbia is 16.1%, Penn State is 35.3%, and MIT is 12.4%. In other words, these are not schools where the majority of the students are white males. In three out of the four, they are the largest single population, yes, but they are not vastly overrepresented, given that the United States is about 30% white and male. There is a little bit of an overrepresentation at Penn State, but not at the other three. If anything, there is not an overrepresentation of white males at elite institutions, but instead actually an underrepresentation of unattractive white males at said colleges. The US Supreme Court ruled in June of 2023 that race based admissions into colleges was illegal in response to a case in which Harvard, in particular, was named as a defendant along with the University of North Carolina. Harvard was accused of disfavoring Asian applicants to, quote, balance the racial proportions of the student body. But was it just race that was playing a role there? Or could it also have been the attractiveness of white men influencing the admissions department? I mean, maybe. But as mentioned, white males do not comprise the majority of any of these institutions and actually tend to be underrepresented per capita compared to the total white male population. 
At MIT, Asian females are the most numerous group when looking at both sex and race, comprising 19.7% of students. It would seem, to me at least, that it's not so much that being an attractive young white man guarantees you admission to a top private institution, but actually much the opposite, that unattractive white males are lower in priority while physical appearance plays little to no role in the admissions consideration process for non-white males. If you're an ugly white guy, you're just kind of screwed. From these data, it doesn't seem so much that being a hot white dude makes you a shoo-in at Harvard, but rather that being an average-looking white guy may instead preclude you from that position. Why? Well, Ong et al. hypothesize that it likely has to do with athletics. Given that star athletes are often accepted at schools for which their grades and test scores would not otherwise make them eligible, and since athletes also, by necessity, need to be in peak physical condition, hence then why there may be more attractive white guys at highly ranked private universities. Not because they're white, not because they're attractive, but because they're good at some particular sport, which probably means they're also in good shape. Either way, the prestige of the college that you attend does matter in some ways, as Ongerol calculated that an incremental decrease in college rank reduced annual salary by $374. When adding beauty into this calculation based on their findings, a one-point decrease in attractiveness was related to an income deficit of 0.03 10 years later in all fields. That's the difference between $97,000 a year versus $100,000 a year based on a one point lower rating of attractiveness. Let me put that another way. Steve is a 10 out of 10. He's a golden god Adonis made flesh and he earns $100,000 a year. If we were to go back in time and imagine a scenario wherein Steve had acid thrown on his face, the then acid faced Steve, if considered a 1 out of 10, would make about $23,000 less every year. Again, remember that it seems that the only group benefiting from the beauty premium, while seemingly simultaneously being harmed by the ugly tax, is white men. Women and non-white students are statistically unaffected by physical appearance in admissions and thus receive the financial rewards of graduating from an elite school without the added criteria of needing to be hot to get in. But hang on, because getting into MIT doesn't mean you're going to succeed at that school, let alone graduate and reap the rewards of being an attractive white man who is more likely to be accepted there than an unattractive white man if you just can't actually compete academically. So is there a relationship between attractiveness and grades? Hernandez, Julian, and Peters 2017 used the photos of students at the Metropolitan State University of Denver who were currently enrolled and had grade records from 2006 to 2011 to compare perceptions of physical attractiveness with actual academic performance. And it's important to keep this study in mind because it's nearly this exact same methodology that would later be used by Mehek, hence why it's a paper that he cites in his own research. But hang on, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. For now, it's just important to know that the university's Institutional Review Board, which deems whether or not a study involving human or animal subjects is ethical, approved this project. 28 male and female participants rated the attractiveness of their fellow students on a scale from 1 to 10, with any photos of students who the participants knew personally being omitted, as were any students with visible disabilities. All participants saw the first 50 images to establish and to rate a reliability, and then 350 additional photos, totaling over 4,000 students. Appearance ratings fell on a relatively normal curve, but skewed slightly towards more attractive than towards less attractive in general, indicating that the raters were being probably a bit polite. Students enrolled in online programs were persistently rated as less attractive than students enrolled in offline programs. Despite this trend, it did not appear that the less attractive students were more likely to enroll in online courses, perhaps out of fear of favoritism, as attractiveness was unrelated to professor gender, enrollment in online courses, and enrollment in objective courses for both male and female students. It just seems like nerds kind of tend to prefer the online courses. Nerd! So what about grades? More attractive students and male students both tended to earn lower grades online, but this is not particularly surprising as males tend to earn lower grades and grades in online courses tend to be lower than grades in traditional face-to-face -face courses overall. In general, the most attractive and least attractive female students had slightly lower grades than did average-looking female students. While there was no effect on male physical attractiveness on grade outcomes, 
This may be because extremely attractive women feel that they can coast on their looks alone and extremely unattractive women, well, actually, I don't know why their grades are lower, but it may have something to do with self-esteem. Given that many of these courses took place online in the early to mid-2010s, long before the age of the ubiquity of the collegiate Zoom call, plenty of professors would never have even seen what their students looked like, and as such, it's perhaps unsurprising that in courses where appearance was not observed, attractiveness had no influence on grades as it did in traditional courses. Female professors tended to grade female students who were below average in appearance more harshly than average or above average appearance female students which somewhat surprised me as women tend to be a bit sexually competitive with one another, but only in offline traditional classrooms and not online. Male students' appearance had no effect on the grades given to them by female professors, both online and off. In turn, male professors gave lower grades to female students who were above average in ratings of attractiveness, and particularly so in online courses. Thoughts patrolled, perhaps, or were they generating in those attractive women an incentive to cozy up to teach her? Male instructors also graded male students who were above average physically more harshly, but only in online courses. Despite what these results may seem to imply, it may be that more attractive students are just worse at online courses, even if less attractive students tend to gravitate towards them, but instead that some elements of physical attractiveness can relate to personal motivation. That is, a highly driven student deeply invested in their education may be more willing to also take care of their physical appearance by eating healthy and working out, and not just to care for their bodies, but also their minds, and maybe more motivated to travel to campus. A student who is naturally gifted with good looks but uninterested in their coursework may opt for an online course precisely because it requires less time investment that they could spend elsewhere, cutting out the need to commute or even just walk to and from their dorms to the classroom. Simply put, there are confounding factors. In total, across all professors and all students, Highly attractive female students received significantly lower grades in online courses, which was about two-thirds of the difference between an A- and a B+. And although more of this difference originated from male professors, recall that male professors were harsher on above-average-looking students of both sexes. So is there really a halo effect when it comes to collegiate grades for the most attractive students? No, not really. In fact, for male professors, the opposite tends to be the case. And while the most attractive women received considerably lower marks online compared to average-looking men, it was less than average female students who were graded more harshly by female professors. Hernandez, Julian, and Peter's research was in some ways comparing apples to oranges, though, in that these students in the online courses were not the same students as those in the offline courses. For, as we saw, different students may prefer online courses over traditional courses, and appearance does appear to be somewhat related to student choice in class venue. There are significant confounding factors, as mentioned. But what about the same student in the same class? Does beauty affect school performance? To get a better idea, we can look to a study of Polish university students from Krauszek, 2017, looking specifically at evaluations of bachelor's and master's theses. The Polish university system provides a unique opportunity to study the role of appearance, if any, in grading, because each thesis is reviewed by the student's advisor, who knows him or her personally, and a referee, who typically does not know the student, and thus if looks influence grades, there should be a gap between the evaluation of the referee and that of the advisor. Faculty members at the University of Warsaw were recruited to rate the attractiveness, ranging from 1 to 10, of over 2,000 students, based on their university photo IDs. Interestingly, Dr. Krauszek notes that this choice was made because of ethical concerns that he had with showing these ID photos to student raters, who would normally not have access to the IDs of their fellow students. He found that advisors gave higher grades in general than did referees, regardless of the sex of any of the three involved. And while males earned slightly higher grades, the referee-advisor gap was similar in size for students of either sex. And what difference there was between the sexes was minuscule compared to the referee-advisor gap. Dr. Krawczyk found that attractiveness had no influence on this gap in any condition, meaning that male advisors don't grade female students more favorably when they are particularly attractive, for example, but rather that advisors are more lenient in grading towards all of their students than are dissertation referees, who generally don't know the students whose work that they are evaluating. Once again, then, it doesn't seem that being attractive guarantees success in higher education. So, what about the workforce? 
If we want to fully understand the path from beauty to college success to career and wages, we should look to a study from Steinbrecher, Steinbrechner, and Sullivan, 2019, who surveyed undergraduates who entered Berea College in fall of 2000 and 2001, and did so approximately 60 times between then and 2014. Student IDs with color photographs were provided to 50 evaluators who were asked to rate their attractiveness on a scale from 1 to 5, who they plotted on a mostly normal curve, again, but did rate fewer men as highly attractive compared to women, giving the women a broader standard deviation. If you catch my drift. Get it? Because they're broads? Boo! You stink! The high school and college GPA, hourly wage, type of employment, be it high or low in skill, and if the job concerned either information-based or interpersonal-based tasks, and family income of these students were all assessed, and was done so over time in the years before and after graduation from Beria College. Gee, I sure hope that a university in Poland isn't named after Leventi Beria, famously the worst person in the Soviet Union, which is a, really a difficult thing to have achieved. Uh, everyone An acts of perversion with children as young as seven years old. Seven years old! Anyway, for women, the scholars found that a one-point increase in attractiveness was also associated with a 7.8% increase in wages. Despite the positive relationship that they identified between beauty and GPA, grades both in college and in high school did not significantly affect earnings. Women tended to earn higher wages in careers where interpersonal skills were relevant, and more attractive women tended to find themselves in careers that involved more interpersonal skills. But that doesn't mean that only appearance is important here as the authors also found that respondents who reported their personal communication skills as within the top 25% of Beria graduates also reported wages that were 8.9% higher than other students, even more of a benefit to wages than just physical appearance. Of course, we have seen that more attractive people do tend to often be more confident, so likely there is a considerable amount of overlap there that would be difficult to parse as discrete variables which is evidenced by the fact that including communication skills in the model did not reduce the effect of attractiveness. Again, though, the positive influence of appearance on earnings was limited to occupations that relied on interacting with other people, not on jobs that relied on interacting with information. Specifically, an increase of one standard deviation in attractiveness resulted in a 9.7% increase in wages for those in highly skilled people-oriented jobs and a comparable 9.3% wage increase in low-skilled people-oriented jobs. I know that this is another no-duh finding, like saying that there's nearly a 10% decrease in drowning to death in a job where water isn't involved, but there was no evidence of any effect of physical appearance on information-oriented jobs. When broken down by job type, the effect of GPA also became a significant predictor of wages, but only in highly skilled jobs, with a one-point standard deviation increase in GPA resulting in a 9% and 6.4% increase in wages in interpersonal and informational careers, respectively. For low-skill jobs, the effect of a one-standard deviation increase in GPA was 3.4% and 2.3%, again, respectively. Even with this in mind, the relationship between beauty and success in jobs primarily involving interpersonal tasks was consistent. Specifically, a one-point standard deviation increase in attractiveness increased the probability of primarily working with people by 0.053. More precisely, being in the top 25% of attractiveness increased the likelihood of working with people by 0.122. Highly attractive women seemed to sort themselves into interpersonal jobs regardless of the skill involved in said job. They generally tend towards positions that involve communication regardless of their own competence, that helps explain why the authors also found that the increased wages of attractive women in person-based jobs was more due to the beautiful earning more money in these jobs rather than sorting themselves into particularly lucrative positions. To elaborate, at a low skill level, the prettiest waitress is just going to earn more tips than the less attractive one, while at a higher skill level, due to the halo effect, the most beautiful businesswoman is more likely to persuade investors to hand over their hard-earned cash, yes, but attractive women don't necessarily seek out positions in these person-facing jobs with the intention of abusing their good looks for gain. If you want an example of how this manifests, just look at Elizabeth Holmes, who scammed her way into a billion-dollar empire built on nothing but her face and a wardrobe full of Steve Jobs-esque black turtlenecks. There are no shortcuts to really hard work. Oh, look, there's one. 
Thus, it seems that beauty absolutely is a premium in the workforce, both for high and low skill careers, but only when those careers involve working primarily with people. Recall that everything I've just described were the results for women and only women. So were things vastly different for men? Well, somewhat. For men whose primary tasks involved working with people, a one standard deviation increase in attractiveness was related to a 6.8% increase in wages, regardless of the skill level required. So much as with the waitress or the businesswoman, a handsome waiter gets more tips and a handsome businessman closes more deals. Also similar to the results for women, GPA did play a role in wages, but only for men in high skill jobs, such that a one point increase in GPA was associated with a 9.3% increase in wages. Thus, it seems for both sexes, physical appearance is only really important if you have to work a lot with other people on socially related tasks, whereas GPA is more important for information oriented jobs. And I mean, yeah, obviously that makes sense, right? Your boss doesn't care how cute you are so long as your code is good. But if your job involves interaction with other people, then a charming smile, a fit figure, or a chiseled jaw or doe eyes, gender doesn't really matter. But being hot does when it comes to making the big bucks in any business that focuses on the human element. This doesn't just go one way either. Students absolutely judge the attractiveness of their professors as well. Rate My Professor is a popular website that allows students to leave public reviews of university faculty, and up until 2018 included an option to tag instructors as hot, signified by a chili pepper. But just because RMP removed their hotness rating doesn't mean students don't still judge their instructors' appearances. They always have, and they always will. A study from Hammermesh and Parker with the lovely alliterative title of, quote, Pulchritude and Putative Pedagogical Productivity, published in 2005, used photos of professors from the University of Austin website and asked six undergraduates to rate their physical appearance and compared these ratings to the course evaluation scores that these professors had received from their students. They found that beauty seemed to play a significant role in evaluations, consciously or not as professors who were one standard deviation above the average in looks received an excess evaluation score of 0.46 on their scale compared to those that were one standard deviation below the average, which is almost in itself a full standard deviation change in course evaluation. This effect was more pronounced for male professors, such that attractive male professors benefit from the beauty premium, while unattractive ones suffer from the ugly tax. Intentionally or not, everyone judges everyone else based on their appearance, and those judgments have real-world impact. All of this, though, brings us back to Mehek's study of engineering students at the University of Lund. So let's look a little bit closer at that particular study and the ethical issues that it raised. Mehek's research included photos of 307 students, which were rated by 74 fellow students. Unlike Hernandez, Julian, and Peters 2017, Mehek did not use official student ID photos, but instead, he looked up students' public social media profiles and pulled photos from those profiles. He used the 74 raters to determine the average attractiveness of students and compared those ratings to their grades before and after the COVID lockdowns. As previously stated, the beauty premium was largely depleted when classes moved online. Mehek also looked up the family income of students whose photos he used in order to calculate any interaction between beauty and income. All of that seems, well, just a little bit intrusive, to say the least. The data protection department was certainly frothing at the mouth over this. So none of these 300 plus students had any idea that their social media profiles were being scoured for photos, let alone that their parents' economic profiles were being gathered by Mehek for the purpose of determining how their physical attractiveness may have influenced their grades. Is that a violation of academic ethics? Well, you can let me know in the comments down below, but the university decided that it was not, stating in their response that, quote, the university decides that Adrian Mehek and his supervisors were not guilty of deviating from good research practice. Despite being cleared of misconduct, the University of Lund's report also stated that, quote, it may also reasonably be considered as an invasion of personal integrity to have one's looks rated the way it was done in the study. The execution of the study might thereby have had unethical consequences, even if the letter of the law has been followed. For this, the execution of the study deserves criticism, end quote. 
The Swedish National Board for Assessment of Research also cleared the study of any wrongdoing, and the paper remains up and available in the Economics Letter Journal as of October of 2023. Although Mehik's research was not found to be unethical, it does appear that one of the appendices was removed from the online publication, but even the earliest cached version of the article from August 7th of 2022 does not contain Appendix B, which from its description would have to have been where any personally identifying information would have been located. The fact that I can find no photos of these students, nor even raw image ratings in the publication at any point in time, does raise some questions about the report from Holmquist and Backlund, who again claimed that they were able to track down these students whose images were rated within three minutes. How exactly? I'm not sure, because there is absolutely nothing here that could compromise student data anonymity that I can see. The only thing I can think of is that it may have been included in the print version. Either way, clearly the study left a bad taste in a lot of people's proverbial mouths, and despite the fact that it was cleared, we should still ask the question. Was what Mehik did unethical? Regardless of your opinion on that subject, what Mehik did is far from unique. As previously mentioned, his methods were largely a recreation of Hernandez, Julian, and Peters 2017, who used student ID photos for other students to rate on physical appearance, and that was not similarly scrutinized for it. Was the issue more that Mehik collected the photos from social media rather than from a database of student ID photos, or are both pieces of literature guilty of the same breach of ethics? When does using photos of students without their permission, for any reason, become an ethical issue in academia? Schools post photos of students without their permission all the time. Don't believe me? Take a few minutes and pause this video and go look up your local school district. There's a pretty good chance that your search will lead you to a Facebook page and what's on that Facebook page. Probably a lot of photos of students and unlike Mehik's work, a lot of those photos are going to be of children, not of adults. Schools often highlight specific students for their achievements, further identifying them by including their names. A 2022 study from Rosenberg et al. utilized Crowd Triangle, Facebook's platform made specifically for researchers, to access Facebook's data, which is kind of an astonishing thing that exists at all, but allowing any Tom, Dick, and Harry with a PhD to have back-end access to anything and everything that you've ever posted, and identified over 18 million posts from individual schools and school districts that included photos, and of that 18 million, over 13 million included photos of children. The researchers randomly selected 400 posts from this massive data set to assess in more detail and found that of their sample, 35.4% of photos posted were photos of students. Further, 5.23% included the students' names alongside their image. Extrapolating from this sample to the total number of Facebook posts, made by schools and school districts would indicate that there are approximately 4.9 million posts on Facebook depicting one or more students and around 726,000 posts which directly identified one or more students by name. In other words, photos of students of children are incredibly common and easily accessible online. If you find what Mehik did to be unethical, then, well, he's certainly not alone. And again, I must emphasize that Mehek used photos that students had elected to post on public profiles and were not posted by the University of Lund on its profile, and that Mehek's sample was entirely comprised of legal adults, not children. Out of curiosity, and because I recall being in some photos once featured on my high school's website, I checked out their Facebook page and, yep, just about every other post includes a photo of at least one student but I went to a weird art high school that I figured might not be representative of the norm. So just to examine the ubiquity of this trend, I looked up the elementary school system I attended, and almost every single photo on Facebook contains images of children. I've blurred the images for this video, but you can still get the picture here, no pun intended, right? There are millions upon millions of potentially identifiable images of children on school and school district Facebook pages likely almost all of them posted without the explicit consent of the students, and children can't consent to such a thing anyway, nor then with the consent of their parents. That's kind of terrifying when you think about it, isn't it? The internet is a veritable smorgasbord of images of children certainly posted with purely innocent intent, yet images nonetheless that could be used to identify them, 
And while I'm sure probably any one of these schools or school districts would remove a photo at the request of a parent or student, the sheer number of images is staggering. Again, I know that this is innocent, and it's not being done in any way to harm these children, but it just kind of gives me the creeps. Maybe that's just me. So again, let me know what you think in the comments down below. The prevalence of using photos of subjects without their consent is also endemic in research, outside of just how many photos of children are easily available via a simple Google search online. A study from Rogelik et al. 2022 examined the use of potentially identifiable patient photos in medical journals and found that 30 studies had used identifiable images without explicitly addressing the potential concerns of confidentiality between 1994 and 2020. Of those 30 papers, only 11 included images of patients. While this is an incredibly minuscule number of papers drawn from the total source examined, which included more than 21,000 papers, it still raises ethical concerns as ultimately, patients in those 11 papers did not consent to having their likenesses included in an academic publication for the entire world to see. Even if just one person was uncomfortable with their image being published, that could present a serious ethical issue, and while again extremely rare, there are still publications which include patient photos without notifying those patients nor asking for their consent. In their discussion section, the authors note the increasing capacity for technology to allow photos to be more easily identified, such as DeepFace, Visual Search, Social Mapper, and Amazon Recognition, which could be abused by both private and governmental bodies. Think about that the next time that you post a photo. With the emergence of new AI software appearing on a seemingly near daily basis, the capacity for machines to identify people based on little more than a photo is a growing concern no matter how rare it is that images of participants are used in research publications. Of course, it's not just academia where this issue of privacy is pervasive, it's social media in general. In 2019, a list of 18 female students at Bethesda Chevy Chase High School made the rounds of the student body in which the students rated the girls' appearances. The creators of the list, male students at the same school, were disciplined in some fashion by the school, although the specifics are not public. But what is public knowledge is that those male students were publicly pilloried by their female classmates in person for two hours in a meeting that was intended to last only 45 minutes. One of the students behind the list stated, quote, I recognize that I'm in a position in this world generally, where I have privilege. I'm a white guy at a very rich high school. It's easy for me to lose sight of the consequences of my actions and feel like I'm above something, apologizing for doing so. Whatever you think about that student's actions, I don't think it justifies allowing the girls to scream at their classmate for two hours while he's unable to defend himself all of whom are legally children, while adults stood by and watched. While this scenario involving Mehik is not identical, it is interesting that high school students were seemingly held to greater scrutiny for ostensibly doing the exact same thing that Mehik did, albeit in a non-scholarly context. It is unquestionable that similar things happen at high schools and colleges all over the world, with friends sharing their personal judgments of their classmates' physical appearance in private, if not in public. As we covered, everyone judges everyone else based on their looks, and so long as people voluntarily post photos of themselves on social media, it is inevitable that others will rate their appearance. The question we must ask ourselves, then, must be limited to the context of academic research. Is what Mehik did ethical? Should scholars be able to use publicly available images of private persons in their research without asking for the consent of those depicted in the images? When it comes to participants in research projects, scholars are required to protect their anonymity, but there is an intrinsic lack of anonymity when research involves potentially identifiable photos of other people. Recently, my channel had a video removed due to a privacy complaint made by presumably one of the authors of a piece of research that I reviewed and, frankly, mocked pretty viciously. There was no personal information included in that video beyond the names of the authors who had previously proudly attached those same names to a study that they published in a publicly available academic journal, the Bulletin of Applied Transgender Studies. The paper was, in my opinion, hilarious. Not only did it include simple statistical errors, such that there was absolutely no way that I could replicate the basic calculation they had made, no matter how I tried to figure out how they arrived at their figure, but was so deeply methodologically flawed that their very stimuli 
created a scenario wherein the participants themselves were viciously mocking the authors. Regardless of the fact that I did nothing more than make fun of a publicly published paper, one of the authors, I presume, felt compelled to file a false privacy complaint against the video and had it removed. While I am sympathetic towards the students who had their photos used by Mehik without their consent, the authors of Attack Helicopters and White Supremacy, and yes, that is the title of the study in question, made their study public when they published it. As a result, I should not have been forced to contact the provost at the university where the scholars work, as well as the National Science Foundation, which is a US government program that funded the flawed research, to file formal complaints of academic misconduct. Since filing my complaints, three of the five scholars have had their public profiles removed from the university website, and the only one who ever managed to pick up the phone upon my attempts to contact them responded to me succinctly by saying, quote, I don't want to talk to you. The lead author has gone completely AWOL, and both universities which she had public profiles on as a member of faculty have informed me that she no longer works there, so I can't even find her contact information. I am excluding some specifics here to avoid another erroneous takedown, but the element of import is that the takedown was erroneous. While again, we could argue about the ethics of Mehik's methods, when you publish a paper, that entails inherently that others will scrutinize it, which is what I did. Mehik has repeatedly stood up for his research, despite the criticism, stating, quote, There is a lot of research that can make people uncomfortable. For example, animal studies. The Scandinavian countries also allow researchers to use detailed administrative data on income, debt, mental health, medicine use, and so on. Probably not everyone is okay with this, but the public use of such data is enshrined in our constitution, at least in Sweden. At the end of the day, it is a question about balance between integrity and scientific progress, end quote. Well, we all know how well that's gone in the past. In contrast, the authors of Attack Helicopters and White Supremacy seem to believe that their research should be both public and beyond reproach, which is not the point of academic publication. If you publish a study, it will be critiqued. If not for ethics issues, such as was the case with Mehik, then for methodological or mathematical errors. This is why research is published, not to bring unquestionable acclaim to the researchers, but to be criticized by others and used to further the wealth of human knowledge. That is of particular import when it involves potentially identifiable information about people who did not consent to be included in research. The question then is, what methods go too far to accomplish the goals of science? And with that question in mind, let's come to a few conclusions regarding the case of Adrian Mehik and his research that used photos of students rating their appearance and all without their express consent. Where does the protection of the privacy of students begin and where does it end when it comes to academic integrity and ethics? While Mehik was cleared of misconduct, and certainly was not met by approval from some of the students who, again, did not consent to being participants in his work. Is it ethical to use students' photos for research for any purpose? Or is an ethical boundary only breached when that research concerns writing the physical appearance of others? Was what Mehik did morally wrong? Should students who signed a letter saying that they support a arguable terrorist organization have their faces plastered on a truck and paraded around their own campus? Do people like SS Sniper Wolf really succeed only as a result of the beauty premium while others suffer under the ugly tax? Let me know what you think about all of that in the comments down below because it really does help my videos get promoted in the YouTube algorithm. And also just because I'm genuinely curious. That's why I conducted a survey on it. And if you liked the video, give it a like because that really also helps me out. If you really, really liked it, share it with a friend. You can support my work by heading over to my Patreon or Subscribestar, becoming a member of the channel and using the Super Thanks feature, but subscribing to my Patreon or Subscribestar will get you access to my Discord where I preview all of these videos early and just hang out and join our little social science community. Plus, your name will be listed at the end of every video along with these fine folks you see on the screen right now. If you want something a bit more tangible for your support, you can also check out my merch store where I have new designs based on the curious case of Dr. Eric Stewart. If you would like to see more from me, I run a weekly podcast on the Broken Crown channel with my co-host Spoon, where we talk about news and politics from a monarchical perspective. Yes, it is a real thing. Also linked below. 
Thank you all so much for watching. And as always, dear friends, all time of old.